Hi, I want to go over Love and Prophecy by Dan McCullum. Prophecy honors others. Prophecy is not meant to uncover what is not honorable, but to find buried treasure. The author says, when I was new to prophecy, I often attended meetings where the speakers would use the prophetic to publicly expose sin or personal weaknesses. I admit that this created a fear in the room but not a reverent fear of the awesomeness of God. Rather, it was a fear of being publicly exposed. Many people justify this type of dishonoring others through a misinterpreting of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 24 through 25, which says, But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all as the secrets of their heart are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. When we see these words in the word of convicted of sin and brought under judgment, it certainly appears like you could justify using prophecy to publicly point out or uncover someone's sin to bring them to a place of repentance. People who insist on doing so claim this is some sort of tough love. They believe you confront people prophetically with the truth of their sin and they will repent and worship God. It sounds defensible from the English translation of the scripture, but let's look carefully at the original text. The Greek word translated convicted carries the meaning of convict, refute, confute generally with a suggestion or shame of a person convicted. Once again, that sounds consistent with the view that prophecy should be used to expose sin. However, my conviction from the study of scripture and the greater context of love is that this passage is talking about the greatest sin of all, which is the sin of unbelief. The book of John chapter 16, verse eight through nine says, when he comes, he will prove or convict the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me. It's clear in this context that the sin that the Holy Spirit is convicting the whole world about is the sin of unbelief because the verse explains people do not believe in me. The greatest sin in the world, the one that keeps people from relationship with God and the reality of heaven is to not believe in Christ. Everyone comes to the kingdom by moving from unbelief to faith. If you do not believe upon Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will not see or taste of the kingdom of God. It's true that through the prophetic, we can see a person's sin. That is not the focus of our assignment, nor our message. We don't use the prophetic to point out sin or shame or what is dishonoring about others. But the gift of prophecy does possess the power to confront the universal sin of unbelief. Unbelief is indirectly challenged in every prophetic exchange because you are being confronted with how God sees and knows you. Let's address another phrase from the Corinthian passage, brought under judgment by all. Again, it sounds like it's endorsing the idea of exposing personal sin publicly through the prophetic utterances. The Greek word translated judgment here is anakrino, A-N-A-K-R-I-N-O, and it means to investigate or examine, inquire, scrutinize, sift, or question. Brought under judgment is perhaps a poor translation from a modern understanding of judgment because it certainly is not connected to the actual meaning of the text. We are not judging people, passing sentence on them, nor speaking judgments through prophecy. A prophetic appointment should not end with the receiver experiencing a sense of judgment, shame, or disgrace. How could that be prophecy working through love as commanded in scripture? Judgment here, as its original definition reveals, is speaking about the receiver of a prophetic word, feeling known and seen. The focus of the prophetic is not exposing sin, but uncovering the secret treasures of the heart, things that no one else could know. There is no implication in the passage of secret sins being uncovered. Ultimate prophetic protocol of love does not use the prophetic to dishonor others. Love does not dishonor others. The secrets mentioned in the passage about prophetic public ministry are treasures of the heart, not sins of the soul. Treasures can include dreams, experiences, gifts, callings, relationships, and even things that the individual has forgotten. Secrets of the hearts can be gifts or treasures that you did or did not recognize about yourself. When these are uncovered, there is no dishonor. Rather, there is excitement and opportunity for faith. The receiver feels known and seen by God. 
and the people. It is an honorable exchange. Let's gather the pieces of information that we've studied from 1 Corinthians chapter 14 to reconstruct a healthy biblical interpretation. First, prophecy must work through the ultimate protocol of love. Love does not dishonor. It is not an honor to publicly uncover a person's sin through prophecy. The ultimate sin is unbelief. When the treasures of a person's heart are uncovered, the receiver feels like people have seen, examined, and investigated parts of them that someone could only know by the Spirit of God. In this way, they have been seen, judged, examined. They are internally convicted of their unbelief through the kindness and closeness of God. They fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is truly among you. Scripture tells us that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Let's be practical for a moment. Does the fruit of using public prophecy to expose sin qualify as redemptive or reconciling? The author says, on multiple occasions, I have seen prophets use the prophetic word to publicly expose secret sin. Never did I witness the person who was receiving the word responded with worship. They didn't fall down and worship God saying, God is really among you. Usually they ran out of the building hid themselves in shame, and likely never returned to a Christian gathering. The prophetic word was accurate, but it was not truth wrapped in love. The author also shares, I've also sat in meetings where prophets were calling out the treasures of the heart of pre-Christians. The response was drastically different. The person responded with a sense of awe and wonder. How do you people know all of this about me? They felt examined and seen or judged but not exposed or uncovered. The prophetic drew them in and confronted their unbelief with love, truth, and value. They felt honored to be called out and spoken of in such a positive light. The author tells us, when I share love's protocol for prophecy, people often ask me about three stories from the book of Acts. What about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter five? Or Simon the sorcerer, in Acts chapter 8, and Elimus the sorcerer in Acts chapter 13. In the first story of Ananias and Sapphira, those who lied about an offering were struck dead. In the second story of Simon the sorcerer, Peter seemed to curse the sorcerer for trying to buy the Holy Spirit. And in the third story, Elimus, the false prophet, was struck blind. How do these stories align with the prophetic protocol of love? When interpreting the Bible, it's important to examine the plain teaching of scripture alongside of the record of stories and dialogue. However, when there seems to be a discrepancy between our assumptions drawn from stories and the clearly stated instructions of scripture, we should interpret the former through the clear measure of the latter. We receive what is clearly taught and see how that compares with what we have concluded from the stories. It is very clear from the Bible teaching that prophecy without love is nothing and that love does not dishonor others. How then do we apply love's prophetic protocol to our interpretation of these stories? First, we understand that each of these stories revealed a direct and public challenge to the authenticity and purity of the gospel. It appears that the married couple Ananias and Sapphira were trying to publicly buy attention or influence through lying about their offerings. Simon the sorcerer publicly attempted to try to buy power and purchase a grace gift for personal benefit and attention. And Lemus the sorcerer and false prophet publicly opposed the preaching of the gospel and deliberately tried to turn a government leader away from the faith. In each case, the sin was performed in public, and therefore the trespass was dealt with publicly. These three narratives certainly represent extreme exceptions, extreme exceptions to the normal written rule of love's protocol in scripture. Public sin and direct confrontations to the gospel may sometimes require a different protocol than the normal use of prophecy. New Testament prophecy normally pulls treasures from our past, present, and future to propel us toward a greater identity and destiny. It is God-given grace and tool. We're releasing life on earth as it is in heaven. The normal protocol for prophecy is clearly love. If love does not dishonor others and prophecy must work by love, then prophecy should not normally be used to uncover what is not honorable. Prophecy honors others. If you like this teaching, you can find Carl and Sarita on Facebook, you can find us on YouTube, you can find us on Twitter and TikTok and Instagram. Look under Carl and Sarita. We hope to see you there.